All right, Rev students, we've been in a series, and we are in week four, and this series is called... Look, at some of you guys can read stuff up on the screen. I'm proud of you. You're so smart. Uh, we are in a series called Potential, and we are in week four of it, and uh, we've been talking all about potential. The very first week, I defined it for you. I said, uh, potential is having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. And for the first two weeks of this series, just in case you weren't with us or it was a long time ago, that was five weeks ago now because we were missed one week over winter break. Maybe you forgot what we talked about. Um, the first two weeks, we, we talked uh, about who we are becoming. We talked about the potential of who God is calling us to be and that the potential of who God is calling us to be will be the biggest potential we have our entire life. And we, we said two things the very first. We said, if we're living in the potential that God has for us, we're living lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. And then the second week, we said, hey, if, if we're living in the potential that God has for us, that God has the first place in our life. And then last week, we started looking at that a little bit more practically. What does it look like to walk in this potential? What does it look like to live out this potential? And we looked at the story of David. And so I'm not sure if you were, how many, raise your hand if you were here last week. I think the majority of you here. We looked at the story of David and uh, this particular story of David and, and the, the sin that he fell into it is really a cautionary tale because the same thing could happen to you if you're not careful. And we looked at the words of Paul, and Paul said, hey, flee from sexual sin. Run, get away, that it is dangerous for you. And we saw that in David's life, that, that David made one compromise, and one compromise, and one compromise. And that led him to a place far from God and far from anywhere he wanted to be. And we, we said, I asked the question last week, how would David's life be different if instead in the story it said late one afternoon he, he got up and arose from the couch he was sleeping in, I said, how would his story be different if it said early in the morning he got up and spent time with the Lord? How would his story have been different if he had started making just some of the right steps? And I believe there's another thing in the story that's going to set us up for where we're going today, so I want to read it one more time. 2 Samuel chapter 11 uh, verse 2, it said, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Last week he said, how would David's story have been different if he had been spending time with the Lord? This week, I want to ask you the question, how would David's story have been different if he had been listening to the people speaking into his life? If you throw that verse back up on there, I have a couple of verses underlined. Um, he, he said right there, yes. Someone spoke up when David was in the midst of about to make a really bad decision. Someone spoke up and said, hey, hey, David, 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 let me, let me get your attention real quick. Don't you know that's Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam? Don't you know that's someone that you know's daughter? David, 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 don't you know that that's Uriah's wife, Uriah, your friend, Uriah, your soldier? David, don't you know what you are about to do? And David had people speaking into his life, but he chose not to listen. And I just imagine how would his story have been different if he had been listening to the people speaking into his life. And, and, and when it comes to the idea of, of having people speaking into our life, it's true for David and it's true for us. We need people speaking the right things in our life because the story of David is the story of us. We are one compromise away from one compromise from one compromise to leading ourselves to a place we never thought we would be. And we need people that care about us enough to speak into that. We need to find godly influences in our life. Here's my first point for you guys today. Without people to make you better, 
you can miss out on what's best. Without people to make you better, you can miss out on what's best. I was thinking as I was preparing for this message, I was like, I was like, man, like, what, what, what did I think about my friends when I was your age? Like, what did I think about the people that was around me? And I remember, uh, real quick before I start this, how many people were here uh, when we came back from high school weekend on Sunday? How many people were here? How many people saw my identical twin brother that was here? You, you weren't here? You missed out on it? Some of y'all, was it, was it kind of crazy? The, the people have asked to see my twin brother for so long, and he was here and you missed out on it. Come on a Sunday morning. He might be there again. But, but here's the thing. Well, I remember when I was your age, I was out sick one day. And the people, people always ask us the same questions. Hey, did you guys do any twin stuff? Like that's the only thing. That's the capacity that their brain has for the concept of two people that look alike. Did you guys do twin stuff? And the answer is yes, we did twin stuff. And so uh, I remember when I was out of school one day sick, Josh went into one of my classes and pretended that he was me. And so now he was really bad at it because when they were calling roll, he didn't answer. So it already made him really suspicious. Um, but, th- but then he started acting up and he got in trouble. And it wasn't until like later that day that he told them that it wasn't actually me, that it was him uh, that was in the class, acting a fool, getting into trouble, talking when they weren't supposed to. Uh, and, and the next day I came into school and I walked into that class and everyone's just staring at me. And I was like, this is, I mean, people stare sometimes, I get it, like I'm awesome. But the, the level of intensity of staring was different than normal, right? And so I'm wondering like, what is going on? And, and like I said, when it comes to twins, people just aren't really good at articulating words. They're like, are you, you or the other one? <laughs> and I'm just like, you guys gotta figure out twins a little better, all right? And so I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Am I, am I me? Like, yes. I don't, I don't, is this an existential question? Like, what, what, what are you asking me? And I come to find out that Josh was pretending uh, to be me. And I remember thinking at that time, man, I, like, how, how could the people that, that really knew me, how could the people that were really my friends not know the difference between me and my brother? Like, if they really cared about me, if they, if they really knew me, if they were the, the people in my life that had been put around me to support me and help me and, and, and care, how could they not know that I wasn't him? Like it was me, not the other one, right? Like they should have been able to know that. And so I was thinking about that because that's where you are. Maybe you're looking around at the people around you and you're like, hey, I'm not sure if these people know me. Maybe you're looking around at the people around you and you're saying, hey, I'm not sure that the people around me are making me better. I'm not sure that the people that are around me want what is best for me. And we get so much weird terminology when it comes to like, friends and stuff, like, like people are like, yeah, they're my ride and die, right? You know, that, that's something that people say. They're like, yeah, they're, they're my best friend. If there's a body in my trunk, they're the first person I called, and their only response is, do you have a shovel, right? That's the response. And, and, and as your pastor, I want to lovingly tell you, if someone, if someone says that to you, they are not your friend. They are a murderer <laughs> by every legal code that is out there. And if you do grab a shovel, you are now an accessory to murder and will face up to three years in jail. Right? It's crazy, right? So crazy. But th- th- that's what we think. We're like, hey, I-, I just want someone who just accepts me for who I am and the decisions that I make, right? Maybe you've heard stuff like that before. That's not what's best for you. Sometimes people are doing really, really dumb things and someone needs to come and be like, hey, I care about, enough about you to tell you that what you're doing is dumb. I, ha- I have to do that with my son all the time, right? Like I don't tell him what he's doing dumb because he doesn't understand, right? Like if I told him that, he'd just be like, because that's, that's what he does, he just kind of stares. But, but all the time, I'm, I am watching him do things that are going to hurt him, right? Like I'm watching him run up to the fireplace and he stops right at the fireplace and then he just looks at me. I'm like, hey, don't, don't do it, buddy. The fireplace is bad. It's dangerous. And he, he runs right up to it and then he, he looks at me. And I have to be ready because sometimes he, he, he runs up to it, but he doesn't try to stop, right? And so I, I'm seeing that there is danger. I'm seeing that there's things that, that aren't best for him. And, and because I care about him enough to just not let him run full speed into a fireplace, I'm going to stop him. I'm going to, I'm going to do something about it and in the same way. The people around us should make us better. They should look 
at what's going on in our life and have influence and be able to speak into it. And the Bible actually gives us a lot of practical wisdom on on what that looks like. How do we evaluate the people who are in our lives? I have a couple of verses I wanna walk through with you. The first one is Proverbs 11, 14. It says, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. And when it says guidance here, it's talking about wisdom, direction. Like if no one is speaking true, good, godly things in our life, it says a people falls. Like, I'm not sure if you catch it, that's not a good thing, right? Like it's using imagery here, it's not saying like a bunch of people are just gonna fall down, but it's casting negative imagery. Hey, bad things will happen where there's not guidance. But then on the other side, it says in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. If you wanted to Like I said, we always talk about the Bible is always dealing in parallels. Pastor Jason talked about it uh, on Sunday. There's good and bad. There's light and there's dark. There's wise and there's foolish. And here it says, hey, the abundance of people speaking good things in your life is safety, which means the opposite of that is dangerous. Do you have people speaking into your life that want to make you better? Do you have the right kind of people speaking into your life? One of my favorite stories in the Bible uh, is in the Old Testament. I'm gonna, I don't have it up on the screen. I just wanted to, to read it for you because it's comical how funny it is. Um, it's in uh, 1 King, verse 12. It says, then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he was still alive. So Solomon's son has now become king. And he's trying to figure out, he's like, hey, what do I need to do? How do I be a good king? And he says, how do you advise me to answer the people? And they said to him, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and speak good words to them, when, they, when you answer them, they will be your servants forever. And you're like, that sounds like good counsel, right? Like that, sound, like that sounds like someone I wanna be a part of what's going on if they treated me that way, if they did that to me. Here's his response. It said, but he abandoned the counsel of the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him, right? Bad move, all right? Listen, the people that are growing up with you now, listen, some of them are great. Some of you guys are great. Here's the reality. You're still all teenagers. You don't have it all figured out. And if the best source of advice is someone from the same place as you, You're not gonna get all the advice, all of the counsel that's out there. There's people who have walked through what you have walked out. They've walked further. They they are at the places that you want to be and they have so much wisdom for you. The story doesn't end well. He he didn't listen to the old counselors. He listened to his, his buddies, his pals were like, hey, you got this, man. You just go tell them what you want to, right? And he goes up, calls a meeting for all the people of Israel and he says, And now where my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. That word's also translated burden. I will add to your burden. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. He he really went like the other direction with the advice. And the people of Israel, surprisingly enough, didn't like it. So they rebelled and he had to go run away uh, and hide for his life because they were trying to kill him. So moral of the story is don't listen to your dumb friends, right? That's, that's the best thing. If you, if you don't pull out anything else, pull out that. Uh, here's another proverb for you. One who is, this is uh, chapter 12, verse 26. One who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The, the word righteous here doesn't mean someone like when we talk about righteousness being made right with God, that's not what this is saying. This is saying someone who's living right with God. They're, like we talked about the first two weeks, a, a righteous person in this context is someone who's living in a manner worthy of the gospel. A righteous person in this context is someone who has God first in their life. And it says that type of person is a guide to his neighbor. But it says the way of the wicked leads them astray. The scripture is asking us to evaluate the people we have in our lives, the people speaking into our lives. Here's another verse, 1 Thessalonians 
chapter five, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Encourage one another. Build one another up. Are the people that you have put around you in your life, are they encouragers? Do they build you up or do they tear you down? Do, do they make you look bad so that they can look better? Or do they love to celebrate the good things going on in your life? This word encourage here literally means to put courage. They're putting the courage in you, in courage. Words are funny like that, right? So to put the courage into something. And, and listen, here's the cool thing about encouragement. When you have the right people in your life and they are encouraging you, encouragement makes it easier to live in a fallen world. It makes it easier to love people the way that Jesus loved them. It helps us go through difficult times. It creates patience and kindness in us when patience and kindness is difficult. Encouragement makes it easier to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Encouragement makes it easier to make sure that God is first in our life. And, and not only do we want people around us that are putting courage in us when we need it, we need to be those kind of people too. That we build each other up, not tear each other down. And, and culture has gotten so bad at tearing each other down. It's, it's champion that you can crush someone with your words. You can crush someone with your actions so that you might look better for a moment and scripture says, no, the type of people that you want around you is someone that wants to build you up, to celebrate the good that God is doing in your life, not be jealous of it. Maybe you're, you're in here and, you know, we're in the middle of our message. You're like, I thought this was a dating series. Was, what, are, what do my friends have to do with dating, right? Well, here's the reality. The people you will eventually date will probably start off as friends. So if you are surrounding yourself by a good group of friends who are speaking life into you, that encourage you, that build you up, those are great people to potentially date. The other reason is because you're going to have people that care about you speak into your life. You want the people that care most about you to speak into the important parts of your life and like we've already said, who you date, how you date, and who you marry are some of the most important potentials you will ever have to navigate through, and you want the right kind of people encouraging you in those moments. You want the right kind of people building you up for that. You want the right kind of people speaking into it, and you want the right kind of people saying, hey, maybe not. Maybe there's danger down the road. Hey, it's starting to look like you are compromising. Don't you know where that's going you need to have the right type of people. I have two types of people I think it's beneficial for you to have in your life. Uh, these aren't gonna be up on the screens because I wrote it after I wrote my slides, but these are great for you to take notes on. The first one, people, the first type of person you wanna have in your life is people following Jesus the way that you want to in your life stage. People following Jesus the way that you want to in the stage of life that you're in right now. You want to find people that are on your sports teams. You want to find people that are in your classroom. You, are, you want to find people that are playing the video games that you are playing and watching the shows that you are watching, that while you are in the midst of doing those things, they are building you up. They are encouraging you. Th that they care enough about you if you start compromising, if you start making bad decisions, that they care enough about you to say something about it. You want to find people who are following Jesus the way that you want to in the same life stage. The second type of person is you wanna find people following Jesus the way you want to in an older life stage. You wanna find people who are following Jesus the way that you want to in an in older stage of life, that they are where you want to be five years from now. They're where you want to be 10 years from now. They're where you want to be 20 years from now. And you can ask them, hey, I'm, I'm trying to make this decision, but I don't, I don't know what to do. And you're saying, hey, I want to be where you're at one day. Help me get there. And you find people who encourage you in those moments to put courage in you to make the right kind of decisions, who, who build you up, who care enough about you to speak into the hard places of your life. 
Because they, they don't want you to end up like a David. They don't want you to end up as someone who compromised and compromised and compromised and compromised and found themselves in a place they never thought they'd be doing things they never thought they'd be doing. In David's story, we didn't get to the end of David's story. This wrecked David's life. His family was never functional after what he did. Later in life, some of his sons tried to overthrow his throne. He had to go running for his life because his kids were trying to kill him. The rest of his life was dysfunctional. And you can all see the pivot right in those moments where he started compromising and compromising and compromising. And I, I just go back to the beginning of that story. How would David's life have been different if he'd been listening to the people speaking into it? Because we've talked about having the right type of people in it, but you have a responsibility too. You gotta listen to them. You can put all the right people in your life in all the right times, but if you don't listen to the things that they're saying, it's not going to do you any good. And there's people who are older in life that care about you. You have family members. You have aunts and uncles. You have coaches and teachers. You have small group leaders that care about you. And they care about you enough to have hard conversations with you and say, hey, I see danger down the road for you. Man, I, I don't want you to end up where that road goes. Come, come back here with me. I, I care about you too much to let you do something that's going to hurt you. You have people in your life that care about you. The author of Hebrews has the same sentiment in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. He says, take care, brothers. I want you to see, I have a couple words underlined right here. This group language that he has here. Like, this is about us. This is about us doing this together. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you evil, unbelieving hearts, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conf confidence firm to the end. Do you hear the group language that he has there? He says, we, we brothers, don't let any of you fall away from God. Exhort one another every day. That word exhort means to, to beg, to plea. What is he begging and pleading about here? He's begging and pleading. He's saying, hey, I know what sin's gonna do in your life and I don't want you to have to walk through it. He says, I I'm begging and pleading with you that you don't walk towards sin, that you walk towards God. Man, don't walk away from God and be deceived by sin and have your heart start being hardened to the good things in life. He uses this language. He says, every day, every day you're gonna come into a situation, man, and people are going to need people that care about them enough to speak into their lives. Every day you're gonna walk into a situation and you're going to need people to speak into your life. And he's saying that the heart behind it is someone that's begging and someone that's pleading, like, hey, don't go there that doesn't lead to where you think it's going to lead. That's not gonna give you what you think it's going to give you. And I care too much about you to let you be deceived by sin and walk into things that are going to hurt you. He says, don't walk away. Don't walk away because man, you've gotten caught in sin and you don't know how to get out of it. There's people that love you and care about you and are willing to walk through you, through that with you. I mean, maybe you've been deceived by sin and, and you're in relationships and you're pushing relational boundaries and you say, hey, don't be deceived by sin. That's not going where you think it's going to go. He said, think, think about David's story. What if you just listened to the people around you? You wouldn't find yourself in the dysfunction that David found himself later in life. 
He said, how you treat people, all, all of the potentials of your life, you are going to walk in that it is God's best for you to have people speaking into your life, to speak hope into your life, to speak truth into your life. And I, I'll be honest, I don't want you guys to end up like David. I don't want you guys to, to walk and be deceived by sin and compromise and compromise and compromise and compromise. So if that's you, this is us right here in David's story. Say, hey, don't you know? Don't you know what it is that you're doing? Don't you know where it is that that's going to lead you? Don't you know? And it's not just for other people to us, but it's for us to other people as well. That we would care enough about people, the people that God has put in our life, that we would look at what's going on and say, hey, I care about you too much to let you walk in the things that you're walking in. You're walking away from God, not to him in this moment. Now, I, I think about, like I was saying, my, com like my conversation I had about, about wit and how right now I'm in this role of preventing him from harm. That, that's literally my primary job at this moment. Prevent him from harming himself. And like I said, he's, he's all over the place. But if we take him outside, it doesn't take long for him to, to walk out into the grass and then start walking to the driveway. And you'll see him look back. And he'll start at the driveway and then he'll start walking towards the street. And then he'll look back. And he's, he's checking to see if, if we're still there. He's checking to see what, what's going to happen if I do this thing. And, and my job to protect him is to say, hey, I'm not going to let you go further than what's best for you in this moment. He's like, that means I'm gonna have to keep you in the grass because if I let you go into the driveway, you're gonna end up in the road. It's my job to see what's coming for him, the things that he doesn't even, he doesn't even know that cars drive in the road, right? He just thinks the road is this really long place to play on. He doesn't know the dangers of the road. But it's my job to step into the moments and bring him to a place of life, not a place of death. And in the same way, it's your responsibility for the people that God has put around you and the responsibility of the people around you for you to say, I care about you too much to let you play in the road. Because cars are coming, you are gonna get hurt. It is dangerous for you. So who do you have speaking in your life, students? And I, I don't want you to wait till compromise after compromise after compromise to get to that place. And here's the reality, wherever you are on that journey, God loves you. And maybe you think, hey, I feel like I've compromised too much. I don't, I don't think he could still love me where I'm at right now. And if you don't believe that, it, maybe you're like, hey, that's true for other people, but it's not true for me. I would say, look at the cross. That God, fully knowing every single thing that you would ever do wrong, how bad you would be, said, I love you, not just us, but I love you enough to still send my only son to live and to die so that you could have life and that you could have hope. And that's the kind of love that we respond to. And that's the kind of hope that we need to be pointed to. You see, the type of people we need to be around is, is people that point us to the son, not to sin. It's my last point for you guys. We need friends that point us to the Son, not to sin. That when, when we're in the process of compromising, when we're in the process of making bad decisions, when we're trying to figure out life, that we have voices speaking into us, around us, older than us, that are pointing us to Jesus and saying the things that he has for you are better. They're better than the things that you're chasing. They're better than the relationships you're running after. What he has is better for you. So my question for you is twofold. Do you have those people in your life? Do you have people in your life that care about you enough 
to have hard conversations with you and get uncomfortable because they care enough about you that they're not going to let you run in the room. They're not going to let you chase after sin that's going to hurt and harm you. And two, are you that person for the people around you? Are you living in a way that you can speak life and truth into the people God has put around you? Because that's what he's called us to do. We have a responsibility so that the people around us don't fall away from God. Ultimately, their decisions are their decisions, but he said, I've given you the ability to speak into it and prevent it from happening. That's the responsibility that he's given us. Man, may, may we walk out of this room and be great friends to the people around us. Not just, hey, I just accept you. Hey, I just hope that you get what's best for you. But hey, I care enough about you that I'm gonna say that what you're doing right now is really dumb and it's leading you to a place that's not good for you. I care too much about you to let you do that. Pray with me.